Donald Trump was born in 1946, which makes him the perfect baby boomer. You hear that, baby boomers? He's your responsibility. He was born to Fred Trump. Now, Fred Trump has a classic immigrant story in that he came to this country from Sweden. And by Sweden, I mean Germany. You see, the Trumps have a long history of lying about where they came from because of some issues at the beginning of the 20th century about Germany and despotism and trying to take over the world. So simply, they claimed they were Swedish. And Fred, at a young age, becomes quite skilled in real estate and he starts buying up properties and he becomes a notorious landlord, if by landlord you mean slumlord. Fred Trump was a notorious slumlord and eventually has a slumlord empire stretching all across the outer boroughs of New York City, across Brooklyn and Queens. In the earliest part of the 20th century, tens of thousands of people are living in Fred Trump slums among the poorest people in the city. By the time he retired, Fred Trump's slumlord empire was worth an estimated over $400 million, which begs the question, was there something that Fred Trump did to make him so successful? And the answer is yes. And if you went to Trump University, you'd have to pay through the nose to find out, but you can't do that since they're under indictment. So I'm just gonna tell you for free because I'm an artist and a bad capitalist. The secret is this. Fred Trump never, ever, 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 never, ever, ever, ever paid for labor. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but Kylie, didn't multinational corporations come up with this decades later at the advent of globalization? I know, I thought so too. But apparently it turns out the Trump company was ahead of the fucking curve. So here's how it'd work. So you'd work for Fred Trump. You'd do a job for him, you'd be a contractor. You'd work in the hot sun, you would have workers laboring for you and you'd build something. And then you'd send them an invoice. And when the Trump company receives your invoice, they'd burn it. So then you think, hmm, I wonder if that invoice got lost in the mail. So you send a second one and they burn that one too. And then you send them a third and then you think, I don't think they're gonna fucking pay me. And so then you march up to their offices and you start banging on the doors because they've locked them and then they tell you to go fuck yourself. This would go on for an excruciatingly long time until a certain point and Okay, this is the beauty of Fred Trump. Like, he knew exactly when to do this, just the point before litigation. He finally responds. He would bring you into his office, here one of his minions, and he'd say, look, if you keep giving us trouble, you're gonna get blacklisted. You're not gonna be able to work any construction projects. Not any of ours, which is a lot of them, or not any of our partners, and not in this whole area, okay? You're done. You're done. And you would be. You'd be out of business. And then next came the carrot. But hey, it's not gonna come to that. We wanna work with you. So you know what? We're gonna give you all the money. We're gonna give you all the money we owe you. And if by give the money we owe you, it's really 70% of the money we owe you. That was the deal. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh my God, why am I not doing that? That sounds amazing. I know, right? You know, it's kind of like when you go to the supermarket and you're just like, ugh, whatever, man. You know what? Get the organic pineapple. Get the good shit. And so then you fill your cart up with everything and then when you go to the register and they ask you if you want to check out, you're just like, ugh, fuck you. Then you take it to your cart and you just go home. So then people start banging on your door and you're just sitting there eating your organic pineapple. Then all of a sudden a SWAT team arrives demanding money. And so that's the point when you give two thirds of your money through the mail slot and as uh, the SWAT team rolls away, you tell them to go fuck themselves. There's a reason why you're not doing this. It's because you're not a sociopath. Like, okay, don't get me wrong. Like, you might all be assholes. This is the internet after all, but in my experience, even sociopaths don't watch anything that comes out of the American theater, even if it does end up on the internet. Except maybe Hamilton. He was kind of a sociopath too. But even sociopaths have a hard time. Even sociopaths get tired. In fact, the only people who can do this are Trumps because this is how Fred Trump founds the company. This is how Fred Trump does business, and then he passes the business down to his son, Donald, and so he does business in an unbroken chain for over 70 years. This is how the Trump company rips people off. You know, it is kind of inspiring the way that we talk about how things change and businesses don't retain their value. <gasps> Not this business. 
They do things exactly the same today as they did back then. It's easier to win Zelda on maximum difficulty than it is to get one thin dime out of these motherfuckers. Another thing Fred Trump would do is that every three years he'd buy a brand new Cadillac and he would take that brand new Cadillac down to the middle of the slums and he'd park it in the middle of them and all these poor urchin children would come out because they knew what was going to happen next. Fred Trump would reach into his pocket and okay I know this is gonna sound like a French film but it's actually true he would reach for some coins and then throw them into the mud and the kids would scramble for him and then they'd clean his car and then Fred Trump would just pull out a chair to sit in the middle of these slums watching these kids clean his car for coins and sometimes he'd bring Donald and he'd show Donald these kids cleaning his car for coins and they would say to Donald always look rich people respect you when you look rich and that's true the most famous resident that had Fred Trump as a slumlord was Woody Guthrie. And Woody Guthrie, surprising fact, not a fan of Fred Trump. In fact, he wrote several songs about how he despised Fred Trump. Actually, he wrote over 50 songs talking about how much of a racist shitbag Fred Trump was, including the heartless Fred Trump, Trump tells you all you need to know, and fuck this fucking guy, I need more water pressure. Okay, some of those may have been paraphrased. And it's important to be precise with our language, isn't it? You know, this is the internet. We don't wanna say anything wrong or misleading or untrue. You know, us liberals, we really show our intolerance to people who disagree with us. So I feel the need to correct this. I said that Fred Trump was racist. To be fair, I should have said Fred Trump is allegedly racist, to be fair. And I think it's important that we shouldn't assume, you know, we shouldn't judge. Isn't that kind of part of the liberals creed anyway? You know, keep an open mind. And I mean, seriously, my mind is so open. It's almost like I don't even have a mind at all. So let's just use this opportunity to examine Fred Trump and his intersection with people of color. And you know, maybe it's a big misunderstanding. It behooves us, you know, to be fair. And it's a short list really. So let's just lay it out and see what we think. First, in the 40 odd years that Fred Trump ran the Trump company, he never, ever, 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 ever rented to black people. There are no black people. Nowhere. Not anywhere there. But hey, maybe it's a coincidence, right? I mean, I wasn't there at the time and it is a free country after all and maybe black people just didn't want to live there. But it's also true that when people were applying for leases and they were black, on the application they would write a secret code and if there was a secret code on that application, they'd get rejected. And that secret code is they're black. But hey, you know, people run into problems with paperwork all the time. I'm sure it's just a coincidence. There's also that minor point that Fred Trump was in the KKK, but hey people, we shouldn't judge. I've been a member of Weight Watchers and they meet in church basements too. And I could imagine a scenario when you're at a Weight Watchers meeting and you're like, oh, I got lost in the hallway. I think I'm supposed to be in this room, but everybody else seems curiously slimmer and fierce and filled with hatred, but I feel very comfortable here. I think I'm gonna stay a while. And finally, there's that fact that when he would be asked about how he felt about black people throughout his life, he said that he fucking hated them. So I think with all of this, we can kind of build a web work and rest the idea that he was allegedly racist. Allegedly is a powerful word, like how Donald Trump is allegedly a rapist. Allegedly. But we can't say that he allegedly wants to rape someone or that he allegedly likes the idea of sexually assaulting someone because that's not allegedly, that's just factual. Because we have a tape of him saying, you know how I'd like to sexually assault someone? I just wanna grab him by the pussy. We actually have a tape of him telling us exactly the way that he wants to rape. But hey, it's not an action, right? It's just words, right? You know, words, words, words. It's just locker room talk. You know, it was on a bus with a man he just met during working hours, but you know, locker rooms are metaphorical spaces. I've been in locker rooms myself, and when I've been in locker rooms, I think, please don't look at my boobs, and how do I hold this towel that doesn't make me look fat? You know, if I uh, was not having those thoughts, I'd probably think about all this raping talk that goes along in locker rooms. But you know, it's just talk, right? It's not like years ago, there was a woman who brought a suit against Donald Trump claiming, he exactly sexually assaulted her in the way that he described in the tape. Oh, wait a minute. Actually, she did. 
She did exactly. That's spooky, isn't it? You know, how these things happen, but you know, it's just one woman. It's not like that's gonna matter, right? Oh, but wait, there's another woman who claimed that Donald Trump raped her multiple times when she was still an underage child, but that case is still making its way through the courts and there's a court date in December and it's after the election. So that's not gonna matter, right? Oh, but then there was his wife where she claimed he raped her and then she retracted that and said that he raped her in the way that a husband rapes his wife. Hey, I get it. I'm not married, but I can imagine a scenario where you have a long day at the locker room and you get home and the chickens burn and you're like, it's raping time. You know, that seems like totally something that could happen. So three to four women, okay? That's all. I mean, what is the exchange rate nowadays? It's 25 to one, right? You know, 25 women to one man's voice. 25 women or 2.3 metric Cosby's. It's only four women, okay? That's practically nothing. You know, if there were a dozen more, then oh, wait a minute, there actually were a dozen more. So 16 women, not nearly as much as 25. And if we're using Occam's razor, they're all lying. Because of course, all women lie about sexual assault for the obvious, the prizes. Women are often given ponies, tuition at Barnard, an endless supply of Beyonce. There are a number of things you get if you lie about sexual assault in our society, and there's a tremendous amount of women, one after another, who will do it at Donald Trump's expense. That's one explanation. The other explanation is a little hard to confront, right? Because the other explanation is that Donald Trump is a fucking rapist. He is a fucking rapist. He's a raping piece of shit, allegedly. He treats women like meat, and he fucks them, and he rapes them, and he's just a rapist piece of shit, and that is what Donald Trump is. And we are complicit in it. Oh, you didn't think that part through? Because let me be clear, the women that I described before, they had been known for years before this tape. They were known before the election. They're in three or four different biographies of Donald Trump. I mean, you knew this shit already and no one cared because if we had cared, it wouldn't have been possible for him to get to the position where he is today. And we just are complicit. We condone it. And now we have the hypocrisy of going, oh my God, this man is a monster. This is shocking. This is not fucking shocking. Okay? We did it. We all fucking did it. And I guess I fucking did it too. We just let him go through and walk through, allegedly. We have a lot more to cover and some of it is worse than this, if you can believe, so just fucking strap in. Donald Trump was fourth. He was Fred Trump's fourth son and from the day he was born, Fred decided that he was going to take over the company. From his earliest days, his destiny was that he was gonna take over this giant real estate empire and he didn't have another choice. And I imagine that it was hard growing up around somebody who was that racist. And I say that because I grew up around a grandfather who was spectacularly racist. And I mean, not just like on the surface, I mean, he was deeply fucking bigoted. And I loved him and he loved me very, very much. And I remember sitting with him and he talked to me about the rotary saw that could cut different shapes in the wood and how chlorophyll works and how the leaves change colors on the trees and, then he talked to me about the government and that's when the tone would shift because then he'd talk about people. People who haven't experienced hate speech, they don't really understand. It's not an abstraction, it's, it's tangible, it's visceral. There's like an oily quality to the words. And he would speak these things and he would get such pleasure out of it almost like a liturgy. And he would fix me with a glare and he said, you wanna know about the blacks? I'll tell you about the blacks. You know he didn't say blacks, right? And I would listen and I was very uncomfortable though I, I didn't really know why. I mean, after all, I'm like five or six years old. And I remember that I talked to my parents about my grandfather's racism twice, one for each parent. I remember my mother, we were in the car and somehow I brought it up and I just remember her gripping the steering wheel and her knuckles going bone white and she was just like, leave it alone, leave it alone. Okay, leave it alone. Don't talk to me about this, leave it alone. And you have to understand that my mother's emotions range from extremely pissed off to incandescently furious. 
And I mean, she has the same full emotional range as any of us. It's just between those two poles. So when she said that, what she really meant was, I barely got out of that house. I, I cannot deal with this. Please, please don't bring it up. Please just, please don't talk to me about it and just don't ever bring it up. Now, my father, my father brought it up. We were in the car again and apropos of nothing, out of nowhere, he just says, your grandfather is spectacularly racist. And I was so glad that he said that because I had no one to talk to about it. And you start to think that maybe your feelings are valid or maybe it's not real and you should just forget about it. But when you just have one person, someone in authority say, yeah, you know what? I see you and I see what you're talking about and it's fucked up. I see you. It meant the world to me. I mean, it probably wasn't as good as keeping me away from my racist grandfather, but we're family. You gotta work with what you got.